So what we want to do today is show you a number of uh, different cases which hopefully have not been covered before. Uh, joining me today would be Dr. Ayaz uh, Agayev, who's an attending uh, radiologist at the Brigham. And then we also have uh, Vasvi Singh and Chaitu Madamanchi, both of whom are uh, our chief uh, cardiovascular imaging fellows. And Aldo, uh, who you have all met, will be monitoring our uh, chat box and probably reading some of the scans. So before I get started, I wanted to share a little bit about the fellow in training activities uh, of ASNIC. <laughs> all of you are aware that uh, ASNIC uh, provides uh, complimentary membership for fellows. I encourage all of you to become ASNIC members. Uh, so that way you can get to, um, uh, you get a free access to JNC as well. ASNIC also offers what is called a leadership development program. There's a call for applications that we want you to um, look at, look out for in the spring and apply. There's a future leaders program that was held for the first time last year and presumably will happen again this year. We're waiting for that. Then uh, those of you who are interested in being part of ASNIC committees, please uh, email us, email info at asnic.org. We are always looking at including fellows in training in most committees uh, in one role or the other. The ACC fellow in training course that's been run by Dr. Moaz Almala for a number of years, very successful. Then right after the ACC FIT, we usually have a networking event where the FITs get to meet with um, ASNIC leadership. Then as we discussed on Friday, uh, JNC, the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology has a new feature uh, called Fellows Corner. Uh, Dr. Saurabh Malhotra and Dr. Amy Scandry and journal editors have asked us to um, announce this so that all of you can submit um, your papers to the JNC Fellows Corner. Then ASNIC also offers a nuclear cardiology board prep course that is a comprehensive review of all the content uh, that would be very helpful. More importantly, I think what distinguishes ASNIC from some of the other societies, uh, at least imaging societies distinctly, is uh, we do have young investigator awards at the annual meeting, one for basic, one for clinical science. We want to encourage all of you to consider sending your research work and abstracts to this. Uh, usually the deadline is end of April, but given the current situation, it's possible that we'll extend that. So look out for that. Uh, please apply, send us your uh, research. ASNIC also offers what is called a Choosing Wisely Challenge. Um, in the past years, uh, this was a, a grant amount of anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 for a quality improvement project. So any of you can submit a quality improvement project from your own site uh, towards this. More uh, recently, we have uh, reinitiated the ASNIC pilot funding grant. I was a proud recipient of one of these grants and it uh, truly launched uh, my career into amyloidosis research. Uh, when I received the ASNIC grant award, uh, it was only about um, $25,000, but that was important uh, seed money that laid the foundation for all of the research that I'm currently performing in amyloidosis imaging. So. Please, uh, that award is now about $50,000. Uh, please send your research, uh, apply. One of the fellows from UPenn uh, won this grant last year. Please apply this year. <clears throat> the deadline is uh, being extended from April to June. New this year is an additional research grant. This is an ASNIC Pfizer amyloidosis research grant. Uh, please submit your um, research on amyloidosis as well. So this year, as opposed to all other years, we have uh, two research grants here. Then uh, when we have the ICNIC meeting, which is the International Congress of Nuclear Cardiology and Cardiac CT, ASNIC has sponsored several travel grants for our fellows in uh, training. And this is a very simple process. And a number of fellows were able to go to Lisbon. The last meeting was in Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal. And that's a nice way to um, collaborate and to uh, socialize with all of your colleagues and meet international uh, folks there. So any of this, if you're interested in getting more information, please send an email to info at asnic.org. So, so much for the 
page for ASNIC and fellows in training. We hope all of you will join. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the scanners. I really like the format that Dr. Ed Miller and Dr. Moaz Almala and others did, which is go through the equipment in the lab. That's something that we do routinely. At the beginning of the rotation, um, I take the fellows around for a tour of the facility and show them the various scanners that we have. I don't know if this, the names make much sense, but I'll show you some pictures with uh, the application. So for our conventional SPECT perfusion imaging, we're using two CZT scanners. They're called DSPECT scanners. Then for the PET, we have two digital PET CT scanners, Discovery MI. Um, one, we use both for oncology and cardiac applications. We have a sodium iodide detector SPECT CT. It's called Interval SPECT CT. And then the most recent scanner that we acquired is the CZT spec with CT with a 360 degree um, crystal and it's a 360 degree acquisition called Veriton CT. So here's our um, uh, workhorse for perfusion imaging. We have two of these uh, devices. It's an upright imaging. You can also have a semi-recumbent mode. The most important uh, aspect of this is that these detectors are swiveling on their long axis. On the top here, you can see these detector elements. These are vertical plate-like swiveling on their long axis. And this is important because this is different from conventional two-head detector sodium iodide scanners, which perform what is called a step and shoot mode acquisition. Here, this is a continuous acquisition of counts. So what's the huge advantage of this? This is tomographic dynamic imaging is possible. And tomographic dynamic imaging forms the basis for myocardial blood flow quantitation. So this type of detector technology with continuous acquisition has enabled us uh, to perform quantitative myocardial uh, perfusion imaging that was shown in one of the earlier um, slides. Clinically, how does it matter? Here's an example. 40 millicuries uh, injected, two-day study, patient's BMI was 46. This is a conventional sodium iodide spec on the left side of the screen and the right side is the CZT spec. And you can see we use much less amount of radio tracer, but single day study and image quality is uh, superior. Uh, clinical implications, you can also use these scanners to do rapid imaging or low radio tracer dose imaging. So one day stress test protocol, four millicuries, 16 millicuries, and you can get beautiful images with excellent quality gated, here's a case showing in lateral ischemia. Coronary angiogram confirmed this tight lesion in the circumflex, proximal circ, and that was fixed post stent. You see an excellent result. Because it's a continuous acquisition, remember that detection of motion can be challenging. You don't have a multi-frame acquisition, so you don't see the heart moving up and down. So in this uh, scanner, the images have to be viewed very carefully. Here's an example of what we think may be a motion artifact, but this image is very deceptive because this does not tell us anything about motion. How can you detect motion? I think this was covered by some of the attendings. So this was, um, <clears throat> this is a repeat imaging without motion. The way to detect motion would be to look at this sinogram and panogram. So what does the sinogram show? It shows these little jagged appearance and that's what tells you there was motion. Contrast that with the image on the right side where there is a smooth outline without the jagged appearance. So next study is um, one of a 52 year old male. Uh, let me launch the images here and move the screen over there. Are you seeing my uh, DSPECT screen? Uh, my, sorry, Hermes uh, screen here? Yes. Yes, we are. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bala, I, I think someone is, uh, just one of the questions where we load that is asking about the dose and how we decide uh, on the dose uh, for the studies. Yeah, so while the image is lo uh, launching, I can tell you the way we uh, look at the dose, uh, we, we use a weight-based approach. Uh, I can share the table with you at a later point. I don't have it right now, but we are using a weight-based uh, dosing. All right, so here's the example um, of a patient, a 53-year-old man who was referred for chest pain. 
And here are the pictures. All right, Aldo, what do you see here? Okay, so um, I guess we can um, uh, see here is that um, perhaps the uh, LB, um, this is a rest stress acquisition for such a star saying, right? Um, yeah. It was done, stress was done perhaps first. Uh, okay, hold after. on, no, 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 sorry, hold on. I need to show you, there you go. That's your stress and rest. Okay. Rest was done first. Okay, so it's a rest uh, first. Um, so I, I guess uh, looking at the size, um, I feel like the uh, perhaps LB is uh, is at the upper end in terms of uh, of size. Um, we'll have to see that in the in the gate and see what the actual volumes uh, might be to confirm that thought. Uh, looking at the stress, uh, what I really see is that as you go from the base to the apex, the apex start to kind of fade down and uh, lose counts compared to rest. So suggesting there is a reversible defect in there. You can confirm that in your um, you know, horizontal and vertical long axis um, that you have that kind of gradient that is again uh, reversible and is uh, involving the, the septum um, as it's involved in tear wall distally, suggesting that it's probably in the LED kind of distribution. Okay, and there's your polar map confirming that, okay. So the question on this case is on the tomo. What are you seeing here on the sinogram and on the tomo? Sinogram. Yeah, and the sinogram we see that area that uh, we're missing kind of a, a information at the middle. Um, <clears throat> so um, I guess that um, in occasions that could be if you have kind of a splitting of the count, uh, you know, kind of motion can some of that or, or, or a detector. Yeah. So this is something very important to keep in mind that when you're rotating through the sinogram, you absolutely identified it right. So this, on, look at the sinogram. So what you're seeing here is each block comes from one detector. So when you come to the mid portion at that detector, the middle detector, which is detector five or whatever, has is not collecting counts. You see that on the sinogram, you see that on the linogram, and you see on your, I don't know if you can see my arrow pointing, yep. but you can see this big uh, dark area, which is count poor on one of your projection images. Yep. So whenever you see this, you should worry that there is electronic, the electronics of one of the detectors are shut off. So this is a quality control uh, for detector um, QC. So now what you notice is you only see the problem on the stress and not at rest. Right. So the whole thing now brings into question whether your LED defect is real or not. Correct. So this patient was brought back for that reason uh, because what had happened was this was not recognized at the time of the scan. The patient was let go and the patient was brought back and here's the repeat study. And clearly you see the same perfusion defect in the LED that looks completely reversible. And if you look at the repeat Cine image from the 14th, you can see that that's no longer there, <clears throat> okay? So this is a good example of how you use your linogram and sinogram for quality control, not only for patient motion, extra cardiac radio tracer distribution, but you also use it for quality control of your detectors uh, itself. Okay, so let me see if I can. Are you seeing my PowerPoint now? Yes. All right, so this guy is 52, dyslipidemia, multiple medications, went uh, 11 and a half minutes. Here's the 5 millicury 15, and the repeat study was with 15. And here's your coronary angiogram. Look at the catheter in the left main. Look at that lesion here, okay? The proximal LED, a very tight lesion. See that there? So basically this confirms what you saw on your um, perfusion images. There was some disease in the RCA, but it was in fact true. So the teaching point here is make sure that you're confident that whatever you're sharing is um, is actually true and not an artifactual uh, abnormality, okay? So now let's go to the next. There you go. So this was a question. So all of you should now answer patient motion, uh, detector error or arrhythmia, and that's a detector error. 
So now coming back to the other scanner that we talked about, uh, it's a sodium iodide spec CT scanner. It's called an interval scanner or two detector spec CT. The big implications for this scanner are the ability to quantify. So unlike most uh, conventional scanners, here you can compute what is called standardized uptake value. And that may be potentially very helpful uh, in not only for myocardial blood flow quantification, but also for new applications like for hotspot imaging and for uh, PYP scanning. The other scanner that we talked about is the CZT spec CT scanner. Uh, it's called the Veriton. Again, quantitative, it's a 360 degree gantry. And here I can show you a little uh, schematic of how the detectors, these are the detector elements, okay? These are the CZT detector elements that come very close to the patient's body so that the scanner counts are counted without any loss of counts in transit. So this is a huge advantage of this design in that it's a 360 degree acquisition and it gets very close to the patient's body and allows us to also quantify. So <clears throat> here's examples of uh, PYP scans. You've seen a number of these presented already. Here's a negative PYP scan. Uh, on this um, 360 degrees CZT spec CT, completely negative. And here's a patient who has very mild uptake with an SUV of 1.6. And here's a patient with grade three uptake where your myocardial counts are greater than the RIP count. And you can see the mean SUV is higher. So this sort of advances in technology allow us to do something more than what we are conventionally used to which is looking at relative perfusion images. What about PET? Uh, we do have one of the digital PET CT scanners. So this is a PET CT. One part of it is CT, the rear end of this scanner. The second part is the PET. And this is when the scanner was opened up. We had the opportunity to take some pictures. Here's the inside of the PET. And in the back here, in the far end, is the inside of the CT. And what you'll see here is each of these is a detector block, again, at 360 degrees. So it's a tomographic continuous dynamic acquisition. Advantages, again, same thing. You can compute myocardial blood flow. You can perform very low radiation dose imaging because this is a digital scanner and there's a much uh, greater one-to-one -one coupling of the counts that are collected. Now, the disadvantage is motion, correction, motion detection is challenging, again. So you need to look at the dynamic multi-frame acquisition to look at the motion. So here are your PET detectors. This specific scanner that we have is a longer Z-axis. So you can cover more, um, more coverage of the body in fewer uh, bed positions. So that's one of the advantages of uh, this specific scanner. Implications, in addition to blood flow, you can do very low radiation dose. Our ammonia protocol now includes a low dose, high dose. So we do a four millicurie rest ammonia. Look at this image quality here. Very high counts, four millicuries. We are able to quantify myocardial blood flow and 15 millicuries with N13 ammonia. Excellent quality gated file. You can actually see beautiful delineation of the papillary muscles, even with this four millicurie ammonia. And the patient obviously has a perfusion defect in the infralateral wall. Uh, that's reversible. Just uh, a little uh, hint for fellows, how do you compute uh, what the myocardial blood flow, uh, what the radiation dose is for any given protocol? SNNMI has a very nice tool. I don't know if this will work, but if it works, you just click on the hyperlink and you can look at, there you go. Here's the dose tool. So you have all the tracers here. So go ahead and select N13 ammonia. Go ahead and put, I don't know, five. I don't remember what we gave this patient, maybe four millicuries, right? And go down here, dosimetry, and select the later one, which is 2017. And here you have your answer, okay? So according to the radar 2017 dosimetry, effective dose for this rest scan was 0.6 millisieverts, rest ammonia, 0.6 millisieverts. Then you go ahead and plug in your 15 for stress, and then you get 2.4 millisieverts. So basically this has a wide array. You can do that for rubidium, you can do that for technetium, yeah. including PYP. So just so that you're aware, this is on the SNMMI website. 
uh, just use it if you are trying to figure out what the dose is. Okay, so based on that, here you calculate total dose is 3.8 millisieverts for the entire rest of study, including uh, the CT uh, portion of it. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes, uh, five minutes or so, on uh, radionuclide ventriculography. So that goes by a number of different names. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you is we don't use it very often, but we have a request from one of the cardiology program directors to cover this in this course because fellows don't get to see this as much. And at the time of the COVID crisis, is um, some implication that we could be using uh, MAGA scanning for EF estimation uh, in certain patients because this minimizes personal exposure, particularly in COVID positive patients who are oncology patients requiring EF estimation before proceeding with their next cycle of mm -hmm. chemo, you could consider uh, at this time radionuclide ventriculography. The big advantage of this is that it is highly reproducible and um, a number of studies is guidelines from ASNIC showing how to do it. So this is a good reference for you guys to look at. LV ejection fraction, RV ejection fraction, and regurgitant fraction can be calculated using counts. So you could you yeah, enter solid count, count and systolic count and do that. What are the applications? Hi, um, Veronica, could you mute everyone, please? Thank you. Um, so various applications, evaluation of cardiotoxicity, looking at uh, ventricular aneurysm, follow of uh, EF with medical or surgical therapy, uh, most importantly, for estimation, accurate estimation of EF and for estimation of uh, calculation of regurgitant fraction. So I want to show you uh, one case so you can see how we do it. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, most softwares uh, do, most cardiac software packages have a tool where you can estimate EF. They're pretty user-friendly and easy to use. Um, we continue to use planar MAGA scans, although some sites have moved on to SPECT. We find the planar still very helpful. You have three projections, LAO, left lateral, and anterior. Remember the LAO is not a 45 degrees, but it is what is called the best LAO view. So you have to get a circular left ventricle. This should be a nice, perfect circle. And you need to give a little tilt to the detector head so that you don't have overlap of atrial activity. Okay, and you see your right ventricular activity here. So in this particular software, I clicked this thing called MAGA and I already processed it so you can see that. And if I play the scene, you can see the tracking of the contour. Okay, and I can show you how to do this. So go here and just reset it. And it says draw region around the ventricle. So all I do is draw region like this. Okay, and it will track your endoscopy and systole. All right, and it will also give you automatically a background. And this background is important. It needs to be right next to the heart. It should not be in a, a super hot area or a super cold area. So what happens if you move this? So your EF right now is 54, let's say. You put it into a very cold area, okay? That EF, oh, so in this case, it's not changing much because it's not a big difference wherever you go. But in general, your background is subtracted from your denominator. So end diastolic minus end systolic divided by end diastolic minus background. So because the background is subtracted from the denominator, if you have a very hot background, your EF gets overestimated. And if you have a cold background, your EF gets underestimated. So in any case, you can do this way and you can also calculate right ventricular ejection fraction, okay? And for the right ventricle, I usually like to do the dropping the points. So you can drop the points around the right ventricle. Remember, this is a count-based technique. So it's not that critical to have um, an accurate tracing as long as you don't include extra activity uh, in that, okay? And then it says, do your end systolic tracing. So go to your end systolic frame and drop your end systolic tracing there. 
Okay, I probably didn't do a good job here because I dropped uh, one point there. So I can probably edit it a little bit. Okay. So if you do it right, then it's supposed to trace it. I don't want to take too much time doing this, but that's, it's as simple as that. Okay, so that's an example of a MAGA scan showing you how you can calculate uh, ejection fraction. There's a number of different techniques how you can do MAGA. Um, I do have a different example. Let me see if I can show you that. Okay, here's an example of a MAGA scan on a patient. So the previous case I showed you was a patient with breast cancer on her septin, and this was a MAGA scan prior to um, administration of the next cycle. This example is from a 68 year old man um, can you already appreciate that the ventricle is a little dilated visually? You see the ventricle is big. So this patient has uh, had a bicuspid aortic valve. So this was follow-up for ongoing aortic regurgitation. And the reason for the study was to calculate regurgitant fraction. So how do you calculate regurgitant fraction? You just look at LV stroke counts and you subtract RV stroke counts from that and you divide it by LV stroke counts and you get a regurgitant fraction. So basically you go through the same exact uh, thing that you did earlier. Here you have your uh, end diastolic counts, end systolic counts, and you have your stroke counts. So you take your LV stroke counts, you do the same thing on the right ventricle, you get your RV stroke counts, and you plug it in and you get your regurgitant fraction. So this patient had a regurgitant fraction of um, 48%. And this was also confirmed by cardiac MR, which is the most commonly used uh, test for regurgitant fraction. Okay. So any questions, Aldo, on the chat box so far before we switch over to uh, Chaitu? I want to know if Chaitu can be made co-host. Yes. Um, uh, the only question that we have here is uh, wall motion. Uh, I guess how... Uh, oh, how sorry. Va Vasvi is going first, not Chaitu. So Vasvi, can you try sharing your screen, please? Yeah, go ahead, Aldo. Yeah, Dr. Bala, just asking about the wall motion, um, you know, how we report it. Uh, I guess someone asked. On the MAGA scan? Yes. Yes. So on the MAGA scan, remember, we are using planar MAGA, so we don't see all myocardial segments. So you only see the LAO projection, anterior and left lateral. So we can only uh, re report wall motion on those segments. You can't report the other segments. Some people do use SPECT MAGA. And then in, in that case, you can look at um, multiple other areas of wall motion. So let me see if uh, Vasi is able to share her screen. No, Sharmila, it's the same uh, prompt host disabled attendee screen sharing. Uh, I don't think this was okay. it. Yes. All right. So did you email me your... Um... Yes, I share it on Dropbox. It was too large to attach. Oh, okay. So let me see if I can. Dropbox also. Okay, let me see if I can bring it up on Dropbox. So should I get an email link on your Dropbox? Yes, it's uploaded on Dropbox. Okay, so what I'll do in that case is, so maybe Chaitu, I have your PowerPoint, so why don't we go with yours? While, we, sure. while I download uh, Vasvi's presentation, okay? So we'll uh, switch gears a little bit. I just wanted to share with you some of the scanner details and the MAGA scan procedures. And now uh, we have two of our um, chief imaging fellows. So uh, Chaitu will um, present to you a case on um, multimodality imaging in infective endocarditis with uh, didactic uh, education, followed by Vasvi, who will be talking a little bit about amyloidosis. So Chaitu, go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chaitu Madamanchi, and I'm one of the chief cardiovascular imaging fellows at Brigham and Women's. And today I'll be discussing the use of multimodality imaging in the evaluation of patients suspected of having prosthetic valve endocarditis. Next. So I want to begin with a case that we had here about a year ago. The patient was a 39-year-old man with a history of IV drug use who developed serratia and strep sanguis aortic valve endocarditis, resulting in severe aortic insufficiency and an LV pseudoaneurysm. He ultimately underwent surgery with the bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement 
as well as mesh reinforcement of his left ventricular outflow tract. Then nine months later, he presented with flu-like symptoms and was subsequently diagnosed with lactobacillus prosthetic valve endocarditis. Transthoracic echo at the time revealed a vegetation associated with his bioprosthetic aortic valve, but did not reveal any valvular regurgitation. Soon after antimicrobial therapy was initiated, he began to feel well from a symptom standpoint. So he was managed conservatively and treated discharged home and treated with six weeks of antibiotics. Then three months later, he presented again with two weeks of fevers, malaise, chills, and sweats. Next. So here's his TEE. And here you can see that there's a large mobile echo density associated with the non-coronary cusp of the bioprosthetic aortic valve representing a vegetation. You click next, it'll show the next picture. Okay, and the issue was this vegetation burden was similar to his TEE from admission three months prior. There was no evidence of paravalvular abscess or aortic insufficiency and blood cultures remain negative. So there was still concern for ongoing infection. So to help answer this, then next we pursued an FDG PET-CT. Next. So if you look at the top four images, that's panel A, and there you can see that the PET-CT revealed focal intense FDG uptake along the left ventricular apex likely representing infection and possibly a developing abscess. If you look at the bottom two images in panel B, then you can see there's also, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. I think when I downloaded, it just uh, went into us. Okay, there you go. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay, so the bottom two images uh, for panel B, you can see that there's also abnormal FDG uptake along the posterior aspect of the aortic valve prosthesis. This extends anterior to the left atrium and laterally along the pulmonary outflow tract. So this raised concern for paravalvular abscess. So next we pursued a four dimensional cardiac CT to further evaluate this abnormal FDG uptake. So here's the cardiac CT, and on the left in panel A, you can see the red arrow pointing to this large hypodensity arising from the non-coronary aortic valve cusp, and this corresponds to the known vegetation. And then if you look in panel B on the right side, then you can see the LAD, and you'll see that white arrow pointing to a distal LAD occlusion and the rest of the vessel, you can see that there's no evidence of coronary atherosclerosis. So the presence of an abrupt distal LAD occlusion with no atherosclerosis anywhere else suggests that this area likely reflects a region of infarction secondary to septic embolism. Next. So here on the cardiac CT, this is a short axis view of the apex. You'll note that this reveals left ventricular apical inferior hypokinesis. And this corresponds to the area of increased FDG uptake on the PET-CT, as well as the distal LAD occlusion, further supporting that this likely represents sequela from infarction secondary to septic embolism. Of note, this wall motion abnormality was not appreciated on the echocardiogram. Next. So the patient subsequently developed new onset atrial flutter and was placed on anticoagulation. And then the next morning he developed right-sided weakness and aphasia. So neuroimaging was pursued. So on the left in panel A, we have an axial non-contrast head CT. And here you can see it reveals a large left parietal hemorrhage with surrounding vasogenic edema resulting in infacement of regional sulci and mild rightward valsine deviation. 
And on the right in panel B, this is the head CT angiography image, which reveals fusiform dilatation of a distal left MCA branch. And then the red arrow there is pointing to an associated three millimeter mycotic aneurysm within the left parietal hemorrhage. So when you have such focal arterial injury and dilatation in the setting of bacterial infection, it suggests that this is a mycotic aneurysm that causes septic embolism from the aortic valve vegetation. Next. So the patient then underwent craniotomy, hematoma was evacuated, and a small aneurysm of the left MCA was identified and coagulated. And he continued to have dense right-sided hemiplegia. And because of his neurological state, he remained high risk for reoperative valve replacement because if he were to go on bypass, he would require a high dose of systemic heparinization, which could worsen his neurological insult. So at that time, aggressive medical management with antimicrobial therapy was continued. He was discharged to neuro rehab, completed six weeks of antibiotics, and then came back for redo mechanical aortic valve replacement. Next. So this is his excised bioprosthetic aortic valve. And on the left panel, you can see that the valve leaflets are calcified and fibrotic. And on the right side, you can see that there are still large areas of persistent vegetation on the bioprosthetic valve. So in summary, this was a case in which TEE, FDG PET, cardiac CTA, and neuroimaging were all used to diagnose prosthetic valve endocarditis and its complications. So prosthetic, okay, next. So prosthetic valve endocarditis, oh, sorry, next, previous slide, Sherman. Okay, so prosthetic valve endocarditis is a life-threatening disease with an incidence of 0.3 to 1.2% per patient year and is associated with high rates of mortality and comorbidity as well as substantial healthcare costs. So prosthetic valve endocarditis accounts for 20% of all cases. The highest risk is early on within six months of implantation and the risk is actually similar between mechanical and bioprosthetic valves and between aortic and mitral positions. Next. So the pathophysiology of prosthetic valve endocarditis differs from that of native valve disease in several aspects. For one, there's a lower incidence of valvular vegetations and a higher incidence of periannular extension, including abscesses, pseudoaneurysms, aneurysms, and fistula. And that's very important when it comes to the use of other imaging modalities in diagnosing this disease. The anatomic involvement also varies between mechanical valves and bioprosthetic valves. So in mechanical valves, the infection usually involves the junction between the sewing ring and the annulus, leading to perivalvular abscess, valvular dehiscence, pseudoaneurysms, and fistula. And in, next, in bioprosthetic infective endocarditis, infection is more frequently located on the leaflets, leading to cusp rupture, perforation, and vegetations. So the usual consequence of prosthetic valve endocarditis is new prosthetic regurgitation causing heart failure, and less frequently, large vegetations may cause prosthetic valve obstruction. So there's a very high mortality with prosthetic valve endocarditis, uh, between 20 and 30%. And these mortality rates haven't decreased since the 1970s. Part of the reason for this poor prognosis is related to a delay in diagnosis. Uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis represents a diagnostic challenge because echo is the first line imaging test in detecting this disease, but it has poor sensitivity and specificity in evaluating prosthetic valves for endocarditis. Uh, up to 30% of initial echoes can be normal or inconclusive in cases of prosthetic valve endocarditis due to imaging artifacts that are present with both bioprosthetic and mechanical prosthetic valves, but are more prominent in the mechanical valves. So here I want to briefly review a meta-analysis published by Habetz in the European Journal of Radiology in 2015. And they were looking at multimodality imaging and prosthetic valve endocarditis. So they looked at 20 cases, 20 studies rather, and 500 patients. And basically they compared the sensitivity of transthoracic echo versus TEE 
versus cardiac CT and TEE in detecting two presentations of prosthetic valve endocarditis. In the top half of this figure, you can see vegetations and the bottom half in detecting peri periannular extension, specifically abscesses and aneurysms. So in this figure, you can see that TEE and cardiac CT plus TEE were far superior to transthoracic echo in detecting both vegetations. And in the bottom half, you can see they were also superior to TTE in detecting abscesses and aneurysms. And of note, in one of the studies, TEE failed to detect evidence of periannular extension in aortic mechanical prosthetic valve endocarditis 36% of the time. So these results suggest that the addition of cardiac CT to TEE can help improve the diagnostic accuracy of detecting prosthetic valve endocarditis. Another final thing to note is you'll, there are only three studies looking at cardiac CT plus TEE in this meta-analysis, and that's why we have these very broad confidence intervals. Next. The next study I wanna to touch on was published by Sadie in Jack in 2013. And their group was looking to determine the value of FDG PET CT in diagnosing prosthetic valve endocarditis. So they prospectively studied 72 consecutive patients suspected of having prosthetic valve endocarditis. All the patients were subjected to clinical microbiological and echo evaluation with cardiac PET CT performed at admission. And then the final diagnosis was defined according to clinical and or pathological modified Duke criteria, which was determined during a three month follow-up. Next. So what they proposed was adding abnormal FDG uptake at the site of the prosthetic valve to the major criteria for the Duke criteria for infective endocarditis. And when they did that on this table on the right, you can see that they were able to improve the sensitivity from 70% to 97%. Next. The next. So here is their proposed algorithm. You start at the top with your patients whom you have a clinical suspicion of prosthetic valve endocarditis and use the due criteria at admission. And then on the right side, for those who have rejected diagnoses and low suspicion, then you can then pursue alternative diagnoses. And then on the left side, those who have definite prosthetic valve endocarditis, you can pursue treatment. But for those who have possible prosthetic valve endocarditis or rejected by Duke criteria, but still have a high clinical suspicion, then if you add FDG PET CT to the Duke criteria, this can allow for the detection of more definite diagnoses thanks to a higher sensitivity. Next. The final study I want to touch on was published by PTC in Circulation in 2015, and their group was basically looking to determine the value that both FDG PET and cardiac CTA would add in improving the diagnosis of prosthetic valve endocarditis. So this figure here, this summarizes the classification of cases with the use of Duke criteria on admission on the left versus Duke criteria plus FDG PET with non-enhanced CT in the middle versus Duke criteria plus FDG PET plus cardiac CTA on the right. And in the red, those are definitive cases of infective endocarditis. The blue are rejected cases and the orange are possible cases. And what you'll see is that when you add FDG PET with non-enhanced CT to the Duke criteria, you are able to reclassify a significant number of these possible diagnoses to either definitive, definitive endocarditis or rejected endocarditis. And then looking at the middle compared to the right figure, when you add cardiac CTA to FDG PET, then you're able to even further reclassify 47% of these cases of possible infective endocarditis, then establishing a conclusive diagnosis of either definite or rejected endocarditis in 88% of cases. Next. So this table shows the diagnostic performance of the Duke criteria at admission compared to the various imaging modalities and in combination with the imaging modalities. And basically here you can see 
in that first line that when you add cardiac CTA and FDG PET to the Duke criteria, you increase the sensitivity from 55% all the way up to 91%. Next, and then you can see with the bottom line, when you add cardiac CTA and FDG PET to the Duke criteria, you increase the negative predictive value from 61% to 88%. Next. So next I wanna review each of the imaging modalities and some of their strengths and limitations. So with echocardiography for the strengths, transthoracic echo is the first line screening test for infective endocarditis. It's readily available and it provides anatomic and functional data including valvular regurgitation or obstruction and information about systolic function. And there's no radiation involved in this technique. As far as the limitations go, there are artifacts related to prosthetic heart valves. The detection of perivalvular extension, specifically in prosthetic heart valves is difficult. You can assess peripheral complications. And of course there are patients who <clears throat> have contraindications to TEE. Next. So for cardiac CTA, some of the strengths are it's good at detecting evidence of periannular extension, including pseudoaneurysms and can detect abscesses as well. It can detect some valvular vegetations and perforation, as well as evidence of other complications, including septic emboli to the coronary arteries and can also serve as a preoperative evaluation and assessment of the coronaries. Some of the limitations of this modality are you may not be able to detect very small vegetations. And if the patient has arrhythmias, this will cause gating issues and lead to a reduction in image quality, as well as there's a need for radiation and contrast with this technique. Next. So for FDG PET CT, the strengths are there's a high sensitivity in diagnosing prosthetic valve endocarditis. It's especially good at detecting these perivalvular complications. For patients who have been on antibiotics, it can detect ongoing infection or regional extent, as well as embolic phenomenon, and can even lead to alternative diagnoses, uh, such as neoplasms. Some of the limitations are small valvular vegetations, it will not be FTG avid. You can get false positives from post-surgical inflammation and or certain types of surgical glue. Patients who have been on antimicrobial therapy for a long time may have scans that are difficult to interpret, as well as issues related with patient preparation and proper myocardial suppression. So we ask that they have a high fat, no carb diet for 24 hours. Typically we'll ask that they have the lunch and dinner with that diet, followed by a prolonged fast of at least 12 hours. So the European, Society of Cardiology uh, incorporated the advances in cardiac CTA and an FTG PET when they released their 2015 guidelines for the detection of prosthetic valve endocarditis. And basically you can see there at the bottom, you hit next, that they added abnormal FTG uptake at the site of the prosthetic valve, as well as definite paravalvular lesions by cardiac CT to the major criteria. Next. So here's their proposed diagnostic algorithm. And then you can see if you have used your modified Duke criteria and you have either possible infective endocarditis or rejected endocarditis, but a high clinical suspicion. On the right with prosthetic valves, it recommends incorporating FDG PET, cardiac CTA, as well as imaging for embolic events to help increase your diagnostic accuracy. Next. So next, I briefly wanted to talk about the effective delivery of healthcare to patients with endocarditis. And this relies on the formation of a multidisciplinary endocarditis team. So we're fortunate to have one here at the Brigham, which meets regularly to discuss these challenging cases. And we have representation from infectious disease, cardiac surgery, neurology, cardiology, and multimodality imaging. And this is necessary because these patients are at high risk and not only is diagnosis important, but shared decision-making between the patient and all of these stakeholders is important to achieve the best outcomes. 
Next. So this slide basically briefly reviews the pathophysiology of endocarditis. So we start at the left on the top with bacterial entry followed by seeding of inflammatory cells. This leads to valvular vegetations and then complications including periannular extension such as perivalvular abscesses and pseudoaneurysms and fistula and peripheral emboli. And right now, as far as imaging targets go, at the bottom right, you can see we're using FDG PET and cardiac CTA to help detect some of these complications, including periannular extension and peripheral emboli. Then we're using, if you move over to number three, then we're using cardiac CTA and structural echo to help look for valvular vegetations. But the next frontier in imaging for endocarditis will be targeting molecular imaging to help see if we can target the bacterial seeding of inflammatory cells. Next. So some of the advantages of developing molecular imaging agents include increased sensitivity, early disease detection, monitoring treatment response, and identifying resistant strains. And I've listed here a few of the molecular imaging agents that are in the pipeline, including radio-labeled antimicrobials, imaging bacterial-specific carbohydrate metabolism, as well as imaging microbial replication. So just some things to keep an eye on in the future. Next. So to conclude, prosthetic valve endocarditis is a life-threatening illness associated with high mortality and substantial healthcare costs. A multimodality imaging approach is essential in the diagnosis of prosthetic valve endocarditis because echo remains the first line in the detection of this disease, but there are several limitations in evaluating prosthetic heart valves requiring the use of FDG PET and cardiac CTA in selective cases. And finally, in order to effectively deliver healthcare to patients with prosthetic valve endocarditis, this requires the formation of a multidisciplinary endocarditis team, along with shared decision-making with the patient to achieve the best possible outcomes. Uh, that's it. I'd like to thank Dr. Sharmila Dorbala for helping guide my exploration of this topic, as well as our imaging fellowship directors, Drs. Dakar Lee, Blankstein, and Wu, as well as Dr. Ayaz Agayev, one of our vascular radiologists, who will be also presenting some cases uh, later today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chaitu. Excellent presentation. So what we'll do right now is uh, take a little break from the PowerPoint and go to live cases. And uh, Dr. Agayev is online. Let's see if we can see his screen. Ayaz, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, uh, Sharmila. Um, hi. Yes, I can see. Um, we'll share my screen now. Um, do you see the screen now? Uh, no. Yes. You are yes. seeing it? Yes, we see it. Yes. Yeah. So you should see the visage, right? Yes, we're seeing visage. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Good. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sharmila, for your invitation. So, I'm going to briefly present this case. Um, this is a 72-year-old male uh, patient uh, presented with a um, symptoms related to a um, aortic stenosis, and eventually, patient ended up having um, TAVR study to evaluate whether a patient will have a um, uh, aortic um, uh, stand. Oh, sorry, the valve um, uh, placement, and. We did a CTA uh, as a routine uh, part of the uh, protocol, uh, similar to most of the institution would do this uh, CTA study. And what we found on the CTA imaging that there are some um, outpouchings, as you can appreciate in this um, uh, image here. So I'm gonna make it multiplanar so everyone can see that well and nicely. So this is kind of aortic root, as you can see here, there's this focal outpouching uh, at the level of the right coronary cusp, okay? And when you scroll up and down, 
similar outpouching or a slightly different size of outpouching you see in the posterior aspect of the aortic root, which is kind of at the level of the commissure of the left and non-coronary cusp. So when you look on the um, different planes here, um, you can see this outpouching on a sagittal view or kind of like parasagittal view. So this patient presented with two of these outpouchings and we don't see any um, abscess or any collection uh, around the aortic root. The question here would be, what is the differential diagnosis for these outpouching? The first of all that you would consider an aortic root that um, could be a uh, first a traumatic uh, pseudoaneurysm or infectious pseudoaneurysms or mycotic aneurysm, so to say. And then we usually, in these cases, and the, of course the management would be just to an intervention and then uh, replace this uh, whole aortic root and excise these areas. But then um, in aortic root, especially in the native or in the prosthetic aortic uh, root pseudoaneurysms, you have to think about the infective endocarditis. So in this case, we don't see any collection and any abscess um, in this region. Therefore, we raise the concern that could that be a sequela of prior endocarditis? Now, the patient had a healed kind of um, you know, infection and it resulted in focal outpouching uh, at, at, uh, at this level. So with that, uh, we decided to pursue some uh, more imaging uh, to find out whether these are um, infectious or these are just sequela. Uh, Chetu made a beautiful presentation, as you would imagine in our institution, the next step would be the PET-CT. So we ended up doing a PET-CT, so I'm gonna show you here the PET PET CT images. Um, we actually do a fused PET CT images. So basically, we acquire regular PET, C PET CT images uh, to assess the, uh, you know, the whole body PET to assess the um, uh, septic emboli as well as an infectious metastatic infectious as well throughout the body. And then right after that, we do dedicated cardiac bed acquisition for um, specifically to evaluate the aortic root. So what I did here, I fused these two images, a PET CT images and the cardiac uh, CTA or cardiac CTA or regular CTA to find out whether these areas are infected or not. And you clearly, you can see that this larger outpouching here is not FDG avid. However, the one that located posteriorly is FDG avid. So therefore, we have suggested that these are actually not a sequela of prior infective endocarditis. There is actually a real infectious process going on as of now. And then a patient had a very mild um, 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 uh, increase the white black count, but overall uh, he was sick patient, but every, everything was contributed to his aortic problem rather than infection. But then with that, we actually, um, uh, recommended to be evaluated for infective endocarditis as well. Uh, the reason that I also showed this case, uh, the, there is a um, overall concept that PET-CT is not useful for native valves. It's most of the time what will be done as J2 presented, will be done for a, a prosthetic valve evaluation. But in this case, clearly you can see that it's not just prosthetic valves, also native valve can be evaluated with the, uh, uh, with the PET-CT. And also um, uh, we have to mention that, you know, the beauty of the CTA in this case, adding and showing this pseudoaneurysm associated complications with these cases, another, uh, you know, benefit. And also if they wanna do a surgical assessment, at the same time, you can look for the coronaries and to assess whether the patient has a significant stenosis and they have to do some uh, intervention for the corners. Um, I think I'll stop here for this particular case. If they, if you have any. Um... Yes. Yes. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Just to let everyone know, Dr. Agayev is our institutional expert on this. He's leading a document on this for RSNA. 
and he is uh, in charge of our entire um, multimodality team for infective endocarditis. So he is the person to ask questions. I know that Aldo has been monitoring the chats and there are a few questions about uh, white blood cell scans. Yes, I guess, uh, hi, Agnes, how are you? Good. Um, I guess one of the questions that, the, um, uh, that we saw in the chat was like, what's the role of uh, WC scan uh, in, in managing these patients? I mean, uh, definitely, um, uh, PET, I mean, the white blood cell, uh, cell scan is very uh, specific. Uh, however, sensitivity is not as good as PET CT. Therefore, and also, uh, you know, performing um, uh, what I have, uh, you know, got it um, um, from our nuclear medicine colleagues as well, that doing actually white blood cell count scan is a little bit more difficult than, uh, compared to the PET CT. Therefore, we, uh, and also, given that uh, sensitivity issues, we we use um, we use a PET CT rather than white blood cell count scan. Okay. Um, and and I guess just for the group, uh, I think the the other question that I saw there is um, just to kind of go over the kind of the protocol uh, nuclear protocol that we that we use for uh, for PET SDG for infective endocarditis. Say it again. I'm sorry. I, I think this. Yeah. So, so the you know, kind of the yeah. some of the guys were asking about the protocol uh, that we yeah. use. Uh, Aldo, let yes. me step in, and Ayaz uh, will also uh, pitch in. So the protocol uh, is FDG and um, FDG and CT-based coronary angiogram, and Ayaz can discuss a little more on that. But what I want to say a little bit about is how we prep these patients for the FDG scans. So we do prep these patients with high fat, low to zero carb diet whenever possible. And we do that the day prior to the test followed by a 12 hour overnight fast. So that's what happens. The difference from sarcoid to this protocol is we do not need myocardial perfusion imaging. So this is FDG only. The other difference is this is a cardiac bed position FDG followed by a whole body FDG because we have to collect embolic phenomenon and the whole body FDG scan is reported by the nuclear medicine physicians. And the cardiac scan is reported also by the nuclear medicine physicians, but we from the cardiac side look at the echo and other modalities and put together and send them a report. So I asked, did you want to comment about how we evolved our protocol? Yes, that's uh, basically, uh, I mean, we, as you mentioned, after preparation, we acquire this uh, whole body, which will be interpreted by the nuclear medicine and then cardiac CT will be uh, um, interpreted by the cardiac uh, the, the person of the day and who's interpreting the cardiac CT and then uh, cardiac uh, nuclear uh, imaging part will be evaluated by the nuclear medicine uh, or cardiac um, um, uh, attending who's interpreting the uh, uh, nuclear imaging that day. So it's kind of like combined imaging um, and it's a kind of like true multimodality imaging uh, that we bring all this uh, people for certain cases to evaluate these. Uh, these are, uh, most of the time, these are very difficult cases, not very straightforward, uh, but yeah. Um, Perfect, thank you, Ayaz. So this is a new protocol is, for us that we are doing a CT with contrast on all infective endocarditis referrals unless there's a contraindication. So this is a new protocol for us. So whenever there's a request for FPG PET for infective endocarditis, they are automatically protocoled for both studies together. There's All this right. question uh, that they mentioned, can you differentiate between the post-surgical inflammation versus endocarditis on FPG PET CT? Um, this is uh, one of the challenging when you do post, um, in a uh, prosthetic valve evaluation assessment uh, to uh, you know to make sure that the FTG uptake is not inflammatory. Um, so the, uh, we don't have as of now we don't have a definite uh, threshold for SUV or uh, any uh, quantitative number uh, to say that you know this is a number if it's above that this SUV you can say this is inflammation versus uh, infection. There are some paper um, that uh, raises uh, uh, you know the. the uh, proposed numbers uh, around six uh, SUV, but as you know, these numbers could change between the institutions. 
but what I would suggest to use is the focality of the FPG uptake. Uh, there's a nice paper uh, that actually came out this year in the European uh, Heart re uh, Journal, and they have uh, proposed how to differentiate inflammation versus infection. So basically, if you see homogeneous FTG uptake, even if it's uh, around, let's say, the SCP4, then that still could be post-surgical inflammation rather than FTG uptake. But if you see a focal, intense FTG uptake at the prosthetic valve, then most likely that is an infected focus. Uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, we, uh, we should use more of an F, uh, infected focus rather than abscess because an abscess is a little bit uh, vague term um, and you have to have a correlate on a CT to see the collection at that level and then you can um, raise concern for an abscess. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead with your next case, Ayaz? Is it ready or do you need a break? Yeah. No, uh, it really should be ready. Over here. Good. So this is a different uh, uh, disease spectrum here. Uh, so this is a 58-year-old pa patient, a female patient presented with a, um, had a, a long history of um, malignancy, lymphoma, and then uh, completely um, treated. And then she presented with um, uh, with these um, uh, kind of inflammatory symptoms, um, and vague, uh, you know, uh, tiredness, and then patient ended up uh, getting a PET CT for a suspicion of uh, recurrent malignancy. And as you can see in this image here on axial uh, PET images and also on the uh, uh, coronal PET CT images, there is diffuse intense FTG uptake throughout the uh, aorta. Uh, and not, not just in the urethra, yeah. and also in the branches as well. Uh, you can oh, see this the subclavian arteries and also... Um, Reading MRI for... Um, yeah. And then uh, supra-aortic branches also on FTG avid. So uh, as you can clearly say that this is a classic diagnosis of large vessel vasculitis. And um, the way that you have to interpret uh, you have to look at some internal references. Uh, the mo mostly uh, or widely accepted internal reference is the liver. And uh, I have to emphasize that you have to look for st steroid naive patient because with the steroid can mess up with the FTG uptake of the liver. So if you have a steroid naive patient, you can use a liver as internal reference number. If it's um, more than liver and in FTG uptake, if it's more than liver, then you can say that and it's diffuse uh, circumferential FTG uptake along the aortic vessel, then you can um, uh, say that this is a consistent with large vessel vasculitis. And um, also in addition to that, you can look at the um, uh, head and neck vessels. So if you scroll up here, you can see there are some FTG uptake associated with the uh, uh, maxillary arteries here, as well as the temporal arteries. So classic teaching is that you can't see small or medium-sized vessel uh, FTG uptake, but there are two papers just uh, recently this year came out, one, um, one of them actually prospective uh, cohort, and they evaluated the FTG uptake in the temporal arteries or head and neck vessels, superficial uh, vessels. And they found that actually it's quite sensitive to look at the uh, um, uh, to look at these uh, small uh, vessels and, um, and raise a concern for temporal arteritis. Basically, you will do one-stop uh, uh, shopping. You can do temporal artery assessment as well as the, um, you know, aortic uh, in involvement, uh, aortic assessment. Um, as you know, giant cell arteritis or large vessel vasculitis could be cranial and also isolated, meaning that there will be no FTG uh, or no inflammation in the head and neck vessels, just the uh, large vessels in the body. Therefore, FTG, uh, PET-CT, I think is a beautiful imaging modality uh, to evaluate these uh, patients. So this patient actually came for a follow-up after story treatment. So this is a follow-up. You can see that the uh, FTG uptake went down, but it's not completely resolved. So this was almost a more than six month uh, follow-up. There's some areas um, 
and you can see that you know, still persistent. So whenever you have these areas, you have to inform your rheumatologist because um, it has been shown that, although the studies are very small, uh, but it has been shown that when you have a persistent FTG uptake in the uh, aorta or branches, uh, despite the intensive uh, steroid uh, or immunosuppressive treatment, those patients will have more tendency for recurrence. Therefore, you have to be careful not just saying that, you know, it's uh, uh, resolved. You just have to say that, you know, it's went down, but it's not completely resolved. And, uh, uh, you know, just uh, attention for follow-up. And then they have to be careful also with the treatment. And as in this case was the patient was uh, completely kind of waned off from the steroids. And then patient came back with a relapse of disease. Now you can see that there is more intense FTG uptake throughout the aorta. So this is a nice example, I think, of uh, uh, use of the PET-CT, not just in the diagnosis, but also in the, uh, the follow-up of these uh, large vessel vasculitis. And um, I'll stop here uh, before I go to I, the next I piece. Yes, we have a few questions. Um, sure. Excellent case again. So Aldo has uh, been monitoring the chats and maybe he'll ask you the questions. Yes, I, yes, I, I think uh, a common question here has been um, uh, kind of steroids and imaging. So how, I mean, I guess one, um, once you start the steroids, when do you expect to see uh, an attenuation or a decreased sensitivity of your imaging? Mm -hmm. And then if you, if you decide for whatever reason to stop the steroids and see uh, how, um, how many days after like, you stop, you, is, you're good to, to image again to see good. if there's anything. So first of all, um, in this case and this uh, particular example, the first study was uh, when patient uh, was not on a steroid treatment. So it was a steroid naive patient. So in these cases, when you have intense FTG uptake, circumferential throughout the aorta, large vessel, um, then you can easily call this a large vessel vasculitis. However, let's say that patient came with the cranial symptoms and you did ultrasound and you found the patient has a in the cranial GCA, and you started, uh, I mean, you have to start the steroid treatment right away. And then you ended up doing a PET CT later on to make sure that the patient doesn't have any, you know, FTG uptake in the uh, large vessels. Then uh, the window there is three days or 72 hours. If it's more than 72 hours, um, then your sensitivity for detection is uh, FTG uptake throughout the aorta will go substantially low. Average, people saying that in 10 days, if you started uh, steroid after average like 10 days, probably it's not gonna be diagnostic. So you have to do within that uh, three days. And then of course, um, if the patient is on uh, a steroid treatment and you do follow-up imaging, as in this case, it should be completely um, resolved. And if you see it's still some FTG uptake, as in this case, then there's a concern that, although we don't know exactly what's going on, whether it's a persistent inflammation or a smoldering vasculitis uh, or remodel, ves vessel remodeling, that's a kind of like uh, question as of now uh, we're trying to answer. But those are the um, you know challenges right now. Uh, however, if you still see, still see persistent FTG uptake, you have to inform rheumatologists that they have to be very careful with the uh, uh, you know, steroid treatment when they're trying to lower the bills. Hey, Ayaz, uh, I have yes. a question, Sharmila, here. What is yes. the role of uh, MR and geography or CT and geography in guiding uh, response to therapy in these cases of vasculitis? Uh, great question. Uh, I'll, st uh, I'll save this question for the next case because uh, next case will involve that and we'll discuss that. Okay, that's fine. Okay, let's go ahead then. Good, so let's move on to a different case here. So this is a case actually, uh, young patient, 35 years old, um, had a long-standing um, vasculitis. And given the, uh, her age, it, probably you will know that this is a classic Takayasu uh, arthritis. And a patient came uh, with a mild increase in inflammatory symptoms um, very mild, but predominantly his symptoms was uh, anterior abdominal pain. 
uh, abdominal pain, mainly kind of like in the located in the upper abdomen there. And a patient had a um, PET CT. So this is a PET CT image. You can see there's some mild FTG uptake in the kind of crescentric shape in the ascending aorta. And there's some areas in the uh, descending aorta, uh, but it's very difficult to see. Um, uh, and then there's some also this FTG uptake uh, in the uh, abdomen there. We don't know what's going on exactly. So what we can do here, we can look at the uh, uh, other cross-sectional imaging and uh, correlate these findings what's going on with these patients. So we did uh, the CTA for this patient and then the CTA image, uh, let's start from the top. Oops, sorry. Okay, from the CTA, um, you can see that there is a um, kind of like very uh, thick aortic wall and the ascending aorta. And I scroll down here um, and as you can see, there is complete obliteration of the proximal uh, ostium of the RCA, although RCA itself is a very small vessel, but the ostium is completely gone. Now the question is, as uh, Sharmila mentioned, whether these are active disease versus an inactive disease, what's the role of the CT here? So what we can do here, we can fuse these two modalities, CT and a PET CT, to look whether there's this uh, thickened aortic wall on a CTA is active disease versus just treated or chronic disease. As you can see here, this crescentric shape of the uptake here is associated with thickened wall. However, in this, uh, at this level of the um, RCA osteum, there is no FTG uptake. And also I scroll up here, there is a focal FTG uptake at the level of these uh, left subclavian artery, right? And also, in the left distal subclavian artery, there is, um, let me show you in this, in the different views here. So you can see that there is, um, there is a circumferential, um, narrowing of these left subclavian artery, right? Now, but there is no FTG uptake associated with that lesion. So it's clearly showing that you still have thickening of CTA on CTA. However, whether this lesion is active disease or not, you can't answer for the CTA alone. So you need some functional imaging on top of this anatomical imaging. So, um, if you have a patient like this came to you for the first time, you have this focal narrowing here, would you send this patient to the interventionalist to place a stand or do some intervention there? Or first you have to do some uh, treatment before sending that patient. And when you go down all the way to the um, abdomen, to the SMA, you would see that there is a wall thickening at, the, at this level in the aorta, but there's no FTG uptake. However, there's a focal intense FTG uptake associated with the uh, narrowing of the SMA. So um, therefore, you can clearly say that the areas in the ascending aorta, superior artery, the proximal left subclavian artery has active vasculitis on top of the chronic disease throughout the uh, aorta, as well as the left subclavian artery and the distal abdominal aorta. Good. Any questions so far for this case? Um, heart uptake is seen. There's a question that I can see last uh, one, not suppressed. No, so for the uh, vasculitis cases, um, if there is no question, uh, if there's no question for um, coronary artery involvement, we don't do dedicated uh, suppression for the uh, heart. We only do regular PET CT and uh, as well as a CTA uh, at the same time to look for the whole anatomy. Um, but if there, again, if there's a question of the coronary artery involvement, then you can add um, suppression and also you can do a dedicated bed, cardiac bed to assess the coronaries. And um, what else? 
and contrast MRA or MRI. Good. So the contrast uh, MRI, yes, you can do the con contrast enhanced MRI, but the, you know, the same problem you will uh, you will encounter in the MRA because if you have a wall thickening in a chronic patient, uh, that thickened wall will be replaced with a fibrosis. Um, and the fibrosis will have gadolinium retention. Therefore, enhancement at that region, whether this is an active disease or inactive disease, would be extremely difficult to differentiate. Uh, there are some agents, so the specific blood pool agents that I think they use in Europe, uh, and that can be helpful to assess because uh, blood pool agents won't have any, FDG up, uh, any retention within the fibrotic tissue. And so it can help a little bit, but unfortunately in the US, we don't have that many good um, uh, blood pool agents to assess these uh, on MRA. And there's a question of diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, there is uh, there is a um, case report that has been shown that you can use uh, for, uh, in, um, for large vessel vasculitis, uh, but unfortunately it's just uh, anecdotal reports. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a nice concept. You can look at the um, uh, you know the diffusion images. Unfortunately, uh, you can use that only for large vessels, and um, those case reports also look only for the descending aorta because it's always easy to image the descending aorta. It will be challenging in this case to image with, uh, the ascending aorta with diffusion images. Uh, PET protocol for vasculitis. So. Um, it's a similar, a similar, um, uh, you know, um, in terms of the preparation will be similar to any other PET CT uh, imaging uh, that you do for oncology or you know, for um, um, infection. Um, however, we right now the way that we acquire the data, we do two different uh, bets. One is the um, neck all the way to the thighs, and then after that, we acquired the addition, additional bed for the um, head and neck region. And then the head and neck region was specifically acquired to look for uh, medium-sized vessel involvement. As I mentioned earlier in the previous case, if you want to look for temporal arthritis, and the PET-CT uh, can help you with that. Let's take still 90 minutes. So, Ayaz, let's go to the next case. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, I think it's these are the all case. three cases, oh, yes. Perfect. Okay, so then um, if there's any other, so Aldo, do you have any other uh, questions there in the chat that are unanswered? No, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think IS covered uh, most of them, yeah. Okay, so perfect. So thank you very much, Ayaz. Again, great cases, great teaching. Thank you a thank lot. You. Thank you a lot for Thank joining. you all, thank you for your invitation. Thank you to everyone who has been able to join the day seven of ASNIC Nuclear Cardiology Virtual Elective. And I'd like to thank ASNIC and Dr. Dorbala for the opportunity to assist in this FIT educational endeavor. We can go next. In this short 20-minute presentation, we will aim to understand various imaging modalities used in diagnosing and identifying the type of cardiac amyloidosis with a focus on the role of advances in imaging the most common form of cardiac amyloidosis, which is cardiac transthyretin amyloidosis or ATTR. And along the way, describe cases that highlight the incremental role of multimodality imaging in cardiac amyloidosis. Next. So cardiac amyloidosis, as you know, is a disorder in which proteins misfold and deposit as amyloid fibrils that infiltrate the myocardial extracellular space. Next. In ADTR, transthyretin protein derived from the liver may misfold and deposit as fibrils in the heart, either due to a gene mutation leading to variant TTR protein known as mutant or hereditary ATTR, or the native TTR protein may misfold with the aging process known as wild type ATTR or previously known as senile systemic amyloidosis. In AL cardiac amyloidosis, immunoglobulin light chain proteins derived from a plasma cell clone deposit in the heart causing restrictive cardiomyopathy. Next. So cardiac amyloidosis, once considered an elusive diagnosis and untreatable, is now gaining increased attention due to advances in imaging and targeted breakthrough therapies. 
And this talk will focus on various imaging characteristics in cardiac amyloidosis. Next. So starting with our first case, a 74-year-old retired professor with a complaint of mild fatigue and no known cardiovascular comorbidities was referred to cardiology for pre-op evaluation prior to knee replacement surgery after an echo was done for an abnormal ECG. His vitals were within normal range. Physical exam was mostly unremarkable. Notable labs, his troponin T levels were normal. His pro-BNP levels were markedly elevated. Next. His ECG, as you can see, demonstrated sinus rhythm with a PR prolongation, a left anterior fascicular block, an incomplete right bundle branch block, and delayed R wave progression. Next. So a transthoracic echo, as you can see, uh, showed a severely increased LV wall thickness. There is also increased RV wall thickness as seen in the parasternal long axis view on the top. And then there is biatrial dilatation. The LV ejection fraction is preserved. And then there is trace pericardial effusion. So one question that often arises is, how diagnostic are the traditionally described ECG and echo features in cardiac amyloidosis? And then the answer is that they are certainly helpful in increasing the suspicion for the disease, but are neither highly sensitive nor specific for diagnosing this condition. In this study, shown here on the slide, ECGs were evaluated among patients with the three main types of cardiac amyloidosis, and it was demonstrated that the traditionally described ECG features like pseudo-infarct pattern, low voltage uh, QRS by different criteria, were infrequent in cardiac amyloid and did not differ by the amyloid type. Also when present, low voltage is a relatively late finding in cardiac amyloidosis and may not be useful for early identification. Similarly, echocardiographic features of myocardial speckling pattern, increased LV wall thickness, restrictive pattern of diastolic function lack in both sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Next. So what about speckle tracking imaging? So what speckle tracking imaging does is that it analyzes motion by tracking speckles in the ultrasound image. These acoustic markers are statistically equally distributed through the, the myocardium, and a special software tracks the geometric shift of each speckle that represents local tissue movement. Thus, the motion pattern of myocardial tissue is reflected by the motion pattern of the speckles. Strain is simply calculated as the change in length divided by the original length and expressed as a percentage. In this example that is playing of longitudinal strain, the original length is 10 millimeters. With systole, it goes to 8 millimeters. So using our change in length formula works out to be a 20% change. Shortening by convention is used as a negative and lengthening is a positive. So this is a negative minus 20% strain. Anything more than minus 18 to 20% is generally considered normal. On the right-hand side, you can see that this is the apical three-chamber view used for calculating strain in our patient, where each segment is represented by a curve seen below. Where the maximum shortening or highest negative values you can see are in the apical segments, which are like pink and green. Next slide. And when all the apical views, four, three, and two, are plotted on a bull's eye, an apical sparing pattern is easily seen, commonly called as the cherry uh, red spot in the apical region. This essentially represents better contractility in the apical segments when compared to mid and base, commonly seen in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. And despite common echocardiographic appearance of increased LV wall thickness, Longitudinal strain patterns are able to distinguish apical sparing pattern as seen in cardiac amyloidosis shown here from isolated impairment of septal longitudinal strain and septal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if you click next. And then, okay. And then patchy reduction in longitudinal strain as seen in aortic stenosis on the bottom right. Next. So quantitatively, relative apical strain pattern is said to be present when the ratio of the average apical to mid place segments is more than equal to one. Next. The ROC curves shown here using that cutoff value of one are able to differentiate cardiac amyloidosis from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, and left ventricular hypertrophy from hypertensive heart disease. Next. 
And interestingly, this pattern of relative apical sparing persists with clinical progression of the disease. Next. Coming back to our case, a cardiac MRI uh, was done and it shows a preserved LV function with an increased LV mass, as you can see in the short axis, two, three, and four chamber views that are playing here. On CMR perfusion, there is diffuse subendocardial resting first pass myocardial perfusion defect that was seen and is suggestive of my microvascular disease. So as you can see, as we go from the base to the mid to the apical slice, as the first pass gadolinium perfusion comes in, you'll see this diffuse circumferential perfusion defect across all slices. They don't really belong to a coronary territory and is commonly seen in patients with amyloidosis and signifies microvascular dysfunction. Next. On late gadolinium enhancement images, there was a large amount of diffuse LGE, as you can see here throughout the left ventricle, as seen on the short axis, and then the four chamber view, which was highly suggestive for cardiac amyloidosis. Next. So now that we know that the patient most likely has cardiac amyloidosis, how do we distinguish whether it is ATTR or AL non-invasively because the distinction has huge prognostic and therapeutic implications? So radionuclide imaging plays a critical role in the diagnosis of ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. Historically used for myocardial infarct imaging, technetium 99M, bone avid radio tracers like technetium pyrophosphate, which is the one available in the United States, is used to specifically image ATTR obviating the need for an endomyocardial biopsy in most cases. Shown here is the visual grading scheme, where grade zero is no myocardial uptake, as you can see on planar and corresponding SPECT image in the panel below. Grade one is myocardial uptake, less than rib uptake. Grade two is myocardial uptake, which equals a rib uptake. And grade three is myocardial uptake, more than rib uptake. Score of two or more is a positive pyrophosphate scan. Next. In a recent large international collaboration, including here at Brigham, about 1,200 patients who were referred for evaluation of suspected cardiac amyloidosis with bone tracers were analyzed. The authors concluded that the collective findings of more than equal to grade two myocardial radio tracer uptake on bone tracer cardiac skin tegraphy, plus absence of monoclonal gammopathy on serum and urine analysis leads to 100% specificity and positive predictive value for ADTR cardiac amyloidosis, thus mostly obviating the need for an invasive biopsy in these cases. Next. So a proposed algorithm for evaluation of patients with suspected cardiac amyloidosis typically starts with echocardiography or CMR to evaluate for cardiac structure and function. And if ATTR is suspected, a bone avid scintigraphy is performed. If the bone avid tracer cardiac scintigraphy is strongly positive, like grade two or three, and a monoclonal protein is excluded, then transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis is diagnosed with high specificity. In equivocal or negative cases, as shown in step four, further evaluation may be considered, including an endomyo endomyocardial biopsy. Next. So coming back to our case, our patient underwent a REST technetium 99M pyrophosphate planar imaging with spec CT that demonstrated diffuse left ventricular myocardial uptake of the radio tracer greater than rib uptake. So this is grade three. SPECT is essential in addition to planar imaging to make sure that the tracer uptake is indeed myocardial and not just blood pool activity. And his serum and urine analysis was negative for any monoclonal gammopathy, essentially ruling out AL cardiac amyloidosis. So case two. An 82-year-old female with long-standing hypertension and CKD stage 3 presented with increasing shortness of breath for the past year that progressed significantly over the past few months. 30-pound weight loss over the last year, unclear etiology. She also had a technetium 99M Sestamibi reg adenosine stress spec study that showed no perfusion abnormalities. Vitals were within normal range. A physical exam was significant for mild peripheral edema. And basically, she had elevated pro-BNP levels. Her ECG, as you can see here, showed a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation with low QRS voltage diffusely. Next. She had an echocardiogram that showed normal ejection fraction with increased LV wall thickness. 
She also had a relative apical sparing strain pattern on strain imaging to suggest cardiac amyloidosis. A cardiac MRI was ordered that you can see playing here. And it shows increased LV mass along with biatrial enlargement. You can also see mitral regurgitation on four and three chamber views along with bilateral pleural effusions as seen on the axial images. This patient also had circumferential subendocardial resting first pass myocardial perfusion defect, which is consistent with microvascular disease. So if you see the images play again, you can see this dark rim that comes as soon as the contrast enters the LV at the rim of the uh, subendocardium of the LV across the base, mid, and apical slice, suggestive of microvascular disease. On LGE images, there was a large amount of subendocardial to diffuse late gadolinium enhancement predominantly involved in the anterior, lateral, and inferior walls of the LV. You can also see that there is RV and atrial LGE present on these images. Overall, the findings were highly suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis. So now next, the patient underwent a pyrophosphate scan to identify if it was ATTR cardiac amyloidosis, but it was negative, as you can see here, and the spec CT here, you can see, confirms just blood pool activity with no specific myocardial uptake. His serum and urine studies for AL reveal monoclonal gemopathy, and he was referred for a bone marrow biopsy that was positive and was started on chemotherapy for AL. However, the patient continued to remain short of breath, and so a TEE was ordered prior to an attempt at cardioversion as she was just started an anticoagulation for this new diagnosis of AFib. And it showed both a left atrial appendage thrombus and a right atrial appendage thrombus. Patients with cardiac amyloidosis are prone to atrial dilatation and AFib. However, in addition to an atrial myopathic... Can you get your ABCD tracer? Nisha, go. Nived is doing a lot of homework. You gotta do some too. Come on. In AL cardiac amyloidosis. Let's do it. I'll help you. Come on, come on. Syndrome, you love doing that. Also made for those... hypercoagulation. Yeah. So you may be able to what find happened? left atrial appendage thrombi even when they are in sinus. Next. So after being diagnosed with AL cardiac amyloidosis, she was enrolled in the MICA or the molecular imaging of primary amyloid cardiomyopathy study at Brigham and underwent an F18 flow beta pair PET CT as shown here that was positive for AL cardiac amyloidosis. Now F18 flow beta pair is a PET tracer just like F18 flow beta pen and F18 flow metamol and they are, and they are FDA approved for beta amyloid imaging in Alzheimer's disease. As compared to the SPEC tracers, PET tracers are quantitative. They allow the possibility of quantifying amyloid burden and detecting a change. Notably, amyloid binding PET tracers are the only clinical available radio tracers to adequately image AL amyloid burden in the heart. Next. And with that, I want to highlight some excellent resources that are available on the ASNEX website. The practice points document describes all the critical components involved in performing technician pyrophosphate imaging for the evaluation of ATTR. Next. And this table is from the expert consensus uh, document for recommendations for criteria for diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, describing in further detail what we discussed previously and essentially highlighting the diagnostic criteria using imaging for ATTR and using biopsy for AL cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you. Next slide. Perfect. Thank you very much. This is launching. I just want to um, show two more cases. I think in this particular session, what we try to do is we try to highlight some of the less common uh, but cutting edge applications of nuclear cardiology. So those of you interested in going into imaging or even uh, practicing cardiology, we want you to understand that there's a lot you could do with this technique, particularly to manage uh, disease. You've heard about infective endocarditis, vasculitis, heard about amyloidosis, and of course, several of the faculty members already shared with you sarcoidosis imaging. So now I want to share with you uh, cases of uh, two cases of pediatric uh, imaging. 
So here's an example of an M13 ammonia PET in a 12-year-old. I hope you're able to see the screen here. Uh, in a 12-year-old patient and uh, on the top uh, so, Aldo, would you like to read this case? Uh, yes. Or anyone can read. I don't know if you have any volunteers that would like to read. Yeah, maybe. Uh, is there any volunteer that want to just take this on? See if there's any anyone raising their hand. You read this like any other uh, perfusion study, so don't worry about the age of the. All right, why don't you read? We have very little time now, so. Yeah, I think we have one. I think uh, Raghu has uh, hands up. Okay. Can so, you unmute him? Where yeah, is he? You can unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, he can unmute himself, yeah, because I don't know how to find him there. Uh, Raghu? Are you uh, are you good to go? Okay. All right. So why don't you go ahead? We we're having some difficulty hearing him. So. Yeah. So um um I guess that um here we if we come in on cavity size um you know it looks uh, uh relatively preserved in terms of size as far as I can see here. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of that, so um, uh, if we go to the uh, perfusion, so we have stress on top and res is uh, a pet. So uh, I guess that the uh, the thing that I'm seeing is, um, you know, we have a few findings. Uh, I think if you go to the base, that uh, kind of interception that you're actually pointing out. Yeah. Uh, you have a kind of a um, you know moderate to severe uh, defect. that is small, but it is present both in res and stress. So consistent more with a, a fixed defect in that kind of territory. Maybe there's, uh, and then the other thing that I see is that towards the apex, you see that uh, the apical septal inferior may be extending a little into the lateral. Um, there's decreasing counts that seems to be uh, uh, not present necessarily at rest. Uh, that might kind of suggest some reversibility there. Yeah, absolutely. So here's your polar plots. Okay. And that's, uh, I mean, we're seeing that kind of discrete, uh, you know, uh, area at the anterior to septum, which is at the mid segment, which is pretty much similar in stress and rest. Perfect. So abnormal study, you have perfusion defects, and this child is only uh, 12 years old. So here's the story. Um, so 11 year old with a known coronary disease from Kawasaki's um, disease, large coronary aneurysms, presenting with atypical chest pain. We prefer to perform M13 ammonia because you can do exercise. We prefer PET in the pediatric age group because it's lower radiation dose to the patient, particularly in those who have known disease and in whom we may anticipate future need for multiple ischemic evaluations. For, those, for these two reasons, this child was referred from Boston Children's to the Brigham and Women's to get a PET scan with exercise. Uh, in this case, sorry, in this case, this was a rubidium. The next case I'll show you is the exercise. In this case, because we knew already that the patient had aneurysms and obstructive disease, vasodilator stress is perfectly okay. But if you do not know that a priori, then exercise would be preferred. So here, they wanted to look at flow reserve as well. I didn't show, show you the results, but this was a rubidium 82 study with dipredamol with flow reserve. The scan was abnormal, and here's his aneurysm in the left, and look at the right coronary artery with multiple aneurysms, okay? So right. this patient went on to have uh, bypass surgery after this particular study. All right, any questions, Aldo, on this one? No, I think that's okay. a case. So then I'll show you the other case, which is also a young person, and then we will close right after that. So DH, I think. Um, yes, and I guess Nico uh, wanted to, uh, uh, you know, do that one. Nico, are you, uh, are you ready? Yeah, hi, Aldo. How are you? Good. Hi. So hi. Loading up. Give me just one second. Loading up. Sure.
Mm. All right, there you go. We won't go through the usual um, quality control piece just in the interest of time because I know we're getting very close to four o'clock. We're like less sure. than five minutes. So what I immediately uh, strikes my attention here is a um, really small LV cavity and, and uh, significant um, uptake in the RV, both at rest and at stress. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the arresting images, um, I see that the resting image, there's this uh, lateral um, wall uh, defect, um, which is worse than stress. Um, but as I said, a very small LV cavity with, um, um, with uh, RVHs and, and uh, like large RV cavity. Um, exactly, exactly. Okay, so great uh, read on that. So this is a complex congenital. So here's your fusion images. Mm -hmm. So this is a case of actually systemic right ventricle. Okay, mm -hmm. transposition with systemic right ventricle. So this, the anterior chamber is the patient's systemic ventricle. That's why it's better perfused than the posterior chamber, which is the anatomic left ventricle, but that's your subpulmonic ventricle, all right? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that we had was whether this anterior wall of the systemic ventricle was a real perfusion defect here. But when you look at the fusion images, so this is one area where your complex congenital heart disease, where hybrid imaging, particularly with CT, is extremely helpful. So here you see the CT, and you can see that is corresponding to the takeoff of the great vessels. See that? So it's, yeah. a, it's not a real perfusion defect in the basal anterior wall of the systemic ventricle. And of course, we know that this lateral wall is hypoperfused because that is... Um, because that is your uh, subpulmonic ventricle, okay? So that's your subpulmonic ventricle, and this is your actual systemic ventricle. So the problem or the challenge with these cases, again, we chose this because we could do low radiation dose imaging, high quality imaging, but none of the databases work for these patients, right? You want to quantify blood flow? It's very challenging because you're quantifying blood flow to the so-called right ventricle, which is a systemic ventricle in this case. So something to keep in mind uh, in these patients. So Nico, thank you very much. So here's the story. So the patient has transposition of great arteries. She had a sending procedure, transatrial baffling at an age of three months. So both the vena cava go into the left ventricle, which is a subpulmonic ventricle and goes to the lungs. Whereas your anatomic right ventricle, the morphologic right ventricle is the systemic ventricle pumping blood through the iota. Patient had very poor acoustic windows. This was a regadenosone breast rubidium study, medium sized perfusion defect in the basal lateral wall of the pulmonic ventricle showing complete reversibility. That basal lateral wall may be related to hemodynamic changes. So I didn't uh, really put too much effort on that, but that area, there was a question whether there was subpulmonic stenosis. And the question was, was this, um, systemic right ventricle ischemic in the lateral wall causing symptom. And here's the contrast CT angio, and you can nicely see the contrast in the systemic ventricle right there, okay? That is the anterior chamber is your systemic ventricle and the posterior chamber is your anatomic right ventricle, okay? So uh, that's how we use PET sometimes uh, in these patients. Thank you. So the last few seconds, I just want to do quick polling. All right, go ahead and uh, type your votes in the, in the, what do you call, chat box. What is the cause for the limited rubidium PET images? All right, Aldo, what do you have for answers? I think it's a little spread, but uh, I think some of uh, the guys are answering uh, mostly A or B. Uh, okay, perfect. Okay, so this is actually answers A. This is a rubidium 82 study. You see a lot of blood pool activity. And this is a problem with rubidium when your LVEF is very low. You can improve that by increasing what is called a pre-scan delay, but that's what it is. It's not a poor radio tracer quality control. This is not patient motion or shunt. Um, 
So go ahead and vote on this one. You see an anterolateral perfusion defect. Here's your overlay. Go ahead and vote what this might be. All right, what's the answer, Aldo? We have 90 answers. Yeah, A, in, you know, everybody say Okay, that. everybody got it. Okay, now you guys are doing so well. Go ahead and vote on this one. Here's an anterolateral defect here on the stress, not at rest. And here's a spec CT and I have some arrows pointing there. All right, you have answers? Uh, people's going for B, uh, motion. Okay. 